Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos. For those of you who have been following along live time, you know that we took Tuesday off, uh, election day holiday, uh, but we're back. And today we're gonna talk about the Baltimore Conservatory. And I have to start by saying thanks to a woman named Alice Hubbard, um, one of our uh, viewers. Um, she suggested this, so thank you so much, Alice. Let's, uh, let's jump right in. So our conservatory behind me dates to 1888, but we're gonna start our story maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, let's start it in the early 1870s. And by that time, uh, Baltimore City had begun planning for some new attractions to Druid Hill Park, a zoo and a botanical garden. Um, Druid Hill Park was still pretty new. It was created in 1860. Uh, mayor Thomas Swan, uh, the mayor then, had imposed a one penny tax on horse cars, uh, Baltimore's public transportation before street cars came around. Um, and apparently a lot of people took horse cars because that one penny tax uh, was able to generate enough money for the city to buy a big chunk of land from the Rogers family and create Druid Hill Park. But that was 1860. By 1863, we had Druid Lake. That was a nice attraction. People were strolling around that. And a year later in 1864, we got the wonderful Moorish and Chinese pavilions, the colorful pavilions that are still here today. Um, and those were also a great attraction. Um, people like to maybe stop their stroll for a bit and, uh, and uh, join up with other folks there. The pavilions, by the way, were designed by a young architect in his early 20s named George Frederick. And remarkably, this was not his first big public uh, gig. He got the commission to design Baltimore City Hall at the ripe old age of 21. So uh, by this by this point, um, he was old hat at, uh, at designing. Um, and so in the early 1870s, uh, the zoo and the botanical garden were planned. Um, the botanical garden folks uh, got the city to carve out a chunk of land here uh, for the garden, uh, botanical garden, and then even sent one of the committee members, the planning committee members, over to London to Kew Gardens, London's famous Kew Gardens gardens to bring back some good ideas. Um, remember, this was in an age when you didn't just pop down to Dulles Airport and fly across the Atlantic. Um, you had to go by steamship. So this was a big investment to send somebody over. By 1876, the zoo had been started, um, but sadly, the botanical garden idea languished. 1876, nothing. 1877, nothing. 1880, 78, nothing. And in fact, people had almost given up hope, except for the botanical garden advocates. And by 1885, um, they had uh, they got the city to again recommit to a plan. And by 1888, we were ushering in our new glass palm house and adjacent orchid house. Um, and these, let's, uh, let's talk about those for a second. These, uh, Baltimore's conservatory came about in the age of the Crystal Palace. Um, the Crystal Palace was uh, in 1851 um, as part of the Great Exposition in London under Queen Victoria. And Queen, this is really a celebration of the industrial age, the world's first world fair to celebrate industry um, uh, and culture. And in 1851, uh, this uh, world's fair, the exposition, had 10 miles miles of exhibits, 15,000 contributors and exhibitors, over 100,000 different objects, uh, mostly sort of showcasing what the Industrial Revolution could do. And at the center was this great palace, the Crystal Palace, uh, 1,800 feet long, and at its center was a, was a domed, vaulted ceiling that was uh, 170 feet high, three times, the building was three times bigger than St. Paul's Cathedral. And the most remarkable thing, um, it was made out of iron and glass, two products of the industrial age. Um, and for the first time, people could really see into and through a building. It was the, uh, had more surface area of glass than any building before it. Um, really remarkable, and it caused quite a stir. The glass, by the way, was made by a company called Chance Brothers Glass. Um, in the 1830s, they had pioneered a technique to make plate glass um, uh, at the time. And what they did was they took molten glass and they, uh, as it was cooling, they wrapped it around great big cylinders and they swung the cylinders in a trench. Um, and I guess the trench was so that if little pieces of molten glass flew out and they didn't burn the workers, um, but the swinging was so that when the glass uh, hard cooled and hardened, it hardened around this uh, smooth surface of the cylinder as all the bubbles by centrifugal force were pushed to the edge of the cylinder and then eventually out. So you got bubble-less clear glass. And then after it cooled, they cut the glass, carefully cut the glass off of the cylinder. And I know what you're thinking is, well, now you've got nice clear glass, but it's, uh, it's convex or, or concave or whatever. It was curved, whatever it is, curved glass. Um, how did it turn into plate glass? 
glass. And that was the second step. After it was cut off the cylinder, they reheated it over a flat surface, and then as it cooled, they pressed it down. So at the end of the day, you got uh, clear glass um, that had no bubbles and came in big sheets, um, plate glass. And that was the glass, in fact, that went into the Crystal Palace. Um, Chance Brothers also, incidentally, made the glass uh, that is uh, uh, houses the clock Big Ben um, in London, um, and also on this side of the Atlantic made the glass that went into the White House in Washington, D.C. They're still in business, uh, and you can go over next time you're um, in Birmingham, go take a look at uh, Chance Brothers Glass. All right, let's get back to Baltimore. In 1888, uh, we built our wonderful glass and iron palm house um, in, this, uh, in this era. We were not the first in the United States. Um, San Francisco uh, has a wonderful glass pavilion in um, uh, uh, Golden Gate Park um, that was built in 1880, uh, 1879, so a good almost 10 years before ours in 1888. Uh, but ours is the second oldest in the country and really fantastic. Um, for the first time, Baltimoreans got to see exotic plants, just as they were seeing exotic animals at the zoo. Plants that could never grow in our environment could in this new uh, greenhouse made of plate glass. Um, and, uh, and it chugged along doing really well until it got really old. And in 2004, it underwent an enormous restoration. Um, incidentally, a brand new executive director at Baltimore Heritage, me, had the honor of giving it an award for its work from Baltimore Heritage. Um, and uh, it restored the iron and the glass um, and did some really wonderful additions, uh, making it the building and the complex that we know today. Um, at the same time, in that same year, 2004, the name was changed uh, to honor Howard Peters Rawlings. And so today it is the Howard Peters Rawlings uh, Conservatory and Botanical Gardens of Baltimore. That's a heck of a name. I think we all still call it the uh, Conservatory or the Rawlings Conservatory. Incidentally, he was a longtime delegate, Maryland House of Delegates, for this area and was a real champion for uh, West, the West Baltimore neighborhood that he uh, represented, including here in Druid Hill Park. Um, and also, I just have to say, as somebody who has a plural first name, Johns, I always appreciated uh, Delegate Rawlings' work for Baltimore, uh, but also loved the fact that he had a plural name, Peters, as well. So I think uh, those of us with plural names look out for each other. Um, all right, let me wrap up with a story about a cactus. And uh, in 2010, Baltimore's agave, Baltimore's conservatory agave cactus was blooming. This is called the century plant. So once every hundred years or so, the plant sends up an enormous stalk that has a, a big flower at the top of it. The flower bursts open with seeds, hopefully, and, and out under the desert floor they go to create new agave cactus. Agave Americana, I believe, if you're, uh, if you're a botanist. And so hours after decades of plotting away in 2010, um, shot up its shoot 30 feet high. Um, in fact, the folks at the conservatory removed a pane of glass above it so the shoot could, uh, could keep growing upwards. Um, but alas, the poor agave plant, because it was in this wonderful conservatory, didn't realize that it was Baltimore and didn't realize that it was December. And so it sent its shoot up, but the cold outside air uh, froze it. It never flowered and eventually, as all all agaves do, it died. Um, but this story is not going to end on a sad note. Um, we're going to end on a, a more positive note. Um, it was covered, that story was covered in the Baltimore Sun, and one of the Sun's readers um, had a suspicion that a small cutting that he got at a plant sale here several years before was in fact from that agave. And he called up the conservatory, and a friend of mine, Kate Blum, who was the horticulturist here at the time, went out to his house and confirmed, lo and behold, it was uh, an agave plant, and it was from our agave. Um, and so uh, uh, he was uh, more than happy, uh, kindly, but also more than happy to donate uh, his plant to the conservatory. He had done a really good job and the plant was thriving, maybe thriving too much. It was getting way too big for his dining room. And so in 2010, we, uh, we lost our century old agave, uh, but we regained its, uh, its daughter, so to speak. And so now all we have to do is wait another 90 or so years for the next drama here at the conservatory to unfold. All right, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much.